Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Edinburgh, Scotland's legendary underground City of the Dead is one of the most famous supernatural sites in Scotland. The Edinburgh vaults have a dark and unpleasant history. When you enter the vaults, you find yourself in a very cold place, where the darkness is almost absolute. Light seems to simply dissipate in the cavernous space, a maze of tunnels and nooks, sometimes opening up into cavernous spaces other times leading into claustrophobic corners. The Edinburgh Vaults are a series of chambers formed in the 19 arches of the South Bridge in Edinburgh, Scotland, which was completed in 1788. It was deemed to be an appropriate and fitting honor that the bridge's eldest resident, a well-known and respected judge's wife, should be the first to cross this fine architectural structure. Unfortunately, several days before the grand opening, the lady in question passed away. But promises had been made, hands had been shaken, and the city fathers felt obliged to honor their original agreement. And so it was that the first body to cross the South Bridge crossed it in a coffin. The locals were horrified. The bridge was now cursed. The majority of the townsfolk refused point-blank to cross the bridge for many years, preferring instead the awkward and impractical route through the deep valley of the Cowgate. Today, it's easy to say that 18th-century Edinburghers were overly superstitious, but over the following centuries, it slowly became apparent that they might, in fact, have had a point. Now let's return back to the subject of the frightening underground city that lies beneath Edinburgh. For about 30 years, the vaults were used to house taverns, cobblers, and other tradesmen, and as a storage space for smugglers and a hideout for criminals. It is said even serial killers Burke and Hare used the vaults as a storage place and later they sold corpses to medical schools. When the conditions in the vaults deteriorated as a result of damp and poor air quality, the businesses left, and the very poorest of Edinburgh's citizens moved in, though by around 1820 even they are believed to have left as well. Before then, however, plenty had died, some murdered, others of sickness. It is not known when the vaults complex was closed down, with some suggesting as early as 1835 and others as late as 1875. Written records regarding the vault's use during their slum times are virtually non-existent. All that is known is that at some point tons of rubble were dumped into the vaults, making them inaccessible. The vaults were rediscovered by former Scottish rugby internationalist Nori Rowan after he found a tunnel leading to them in the 1980s. About ten years later, Nori Rowan and his son 
excavated the vaults and removed hundreds of tons of rubble by hand. Today, the vaults on the north side of the Cowgate arch from a series of tunnels and vaults and are mainly used for ghost tours. Reports of ghosts were so frequent that media and scholars took interest in this uncanny dark place. This is a very sinister place. There are lots of dark, dark spirits down here," said Nicola Wright, who has worked in and around the vaults for many years. One of the most commonly sighted ghosts is the figure of a jack who tugs at people's trousers or throws stones across the empty, echoing chambers. Then there is Mr. Boots. He earned his name because of the footsteps he makes as he tramps around the afterlife. The worst of them all is Watcher, a spirit reported to instill feelings of dread in psychics and who, as the name suggests, is constantly watching, although sometimes this will move into pushing hair-pulling, and other terrifying activities. The power of the Watcher is strongest in the White Room. People have come out of that room and found they had scratch marks or bruising, they've had their clothes torn, they feel very nauseous. If you take photographs, quite often faces will appear in them. I won't go into that particular room. He warns people not to enter. He shouts at people. He pushes people, according to Nicola Wright. In 2001, Professor Richard Wiseman conducted a study of people spending time in the vaults. In his opinion, people who believed in ghosts reported more supernatural occurrences than those who did not believe, and since there were more sightings and odd events in rooms the participants had been told were haunted, that much of the experience was created in the minds of the people who went in there. So what did people really see down there? We cannot tell, but there is no doubt that the Edinburgh vaults are creepy and the history of this place is sad and dark. As of now, most of the whole area is closed to the public and access is strictly monitored. On April 11, 1907, after being out for 24 hours, the jury in the Harry Thaw murder case announced that they had been unable to reach a verdict in what had become known as the crime of the century. Thaw was charged with the murder of renowned architect Stanford White. While there would be many other spectacular celebrity murders to follow in the 20th century, few would boast participants as famous or events as strange as those in the case of Harry K. Thaw. Harry Thaw was the son of an ambitious Pittsburgh family and heir to a vast fortune that had been earned by quartering the coke market, a product necessary to make steel. The Thaw family connections and wealth had managed to allow the family into the upper crust of New York society. Though well-educated, Harry Thaw was also considered to be rather odd, even by his own family. His school escapades and wild behavior caused his father to limit his allowance to just $2,000 per year. His doting mother supplemented this income with an additional $80,000, and yet Thaw bemoaned the poor state of his finances. He didn't believe that what he considered this paltry amount could possibly support his standard of living. One of Thaw's greatest expenses was the apartment that he maintained at a high-priced New York brothel. Here he would entice young girls with offers of helping them to star in plays and in Broadway shows. Once he had them in his clutches, as the house madam Susan Merrill later testified, he would rape the girls and often beat them badly for his own sexual pleasure. Merrill later stated, I would hear the screams coming from his apartment, and once I could stand it no longer, I rushed into his rooms. He had tied the girl to the bed, naked, and was whipping her. She was covered with welts. Despite Thaw's peculiarities, it is unlikely that he would have come to public attention if he had not become involved with a young woman named Evelyn Nesbitt. She had come to New York at the age of 16, and when Thaw met her, 
she was becoming known as an actress and a model. As a member of the chorus of the hit show Floridora, she was one of the beauties asked the musical question, Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? She also posed for a Charles Dana Gibson drawing called The Eternal Question and was described by some as the loveliest-looking girl who ever breathed. Writer Irvin S. Cobb described Nesbitt in print as having the slim, quick grace of a fawn, a head that sat on her flawless throat as a lily on its stem, eyes that were the color of blue-brown pansies and the size of half dollars, and a mouth made of rumpled rose petals. She looked innocent, but her gentle beauty hid a more sultry side. Soon after arriving in New York, she had become the mistress of millionaire architect Stanford White. The red-haired hulking White was considered the most distinguished architect of his day. He had designed more than 50 of New York's most admired buildings, including Madison Square Garden and the Washington Square Arch. He was credited with being the single greatest influence in beautifying the rather drab brownstone New York City of the 19th century. Madison Square Garden itself, with its amphitheater for horse shows and prize fights, and its theater, roof garden, restaurant, and arcade of fashionable shops, was regarded by most as his greatest accomplishment. But there was another side to the acclaimed architect. He enjoyed mixing in theatrical and bohemian circles, was an avid partygoer, and, although married, loved pretty girls. After meeting young Evelyn Nesbitt, he seduced the teenager and gave her large amounts of money, expensive clothing, and jewelry. Evelyn remained with White until she was 19, and at that point she left him and became involved with Harry Thaw. He married her on April 4, 1904, when she was 20 years old. In the interval, he had twice lived with her as man and wife on trips to Europe and caused a major New York scandal when the two of them were evicted from a hotel where they were blatantly cohabiting. Despite ensnaring the girl of his dreams, Harry Thaw was slowly going insane. During the first 14 months of their marriage, Thaw persecuted Evelyn about her former relationship with White. He refused to allow her to use White's name and only permitted her to refer to him as the Beast or the Bastard. Once while crossing the Atlantic on a vacation to Europe, Thaw tied Evelyn to a bed in their stateroom. He beat her with a belt for hours and made her confess every sexual act in which she had engaged with Stanford White. To stop the whipping, she later confessed that she made things up just to appease her brutal husband, claiming that White raped her and forced her to pose naked with other women. Evelyn's tales only incensed Thaw even further, and he vowed revenge. He would sometimes carry a revolver around the house and would mumble to himself about saving other young girls from sharing Evelyn's fate. Thaw's revenge came on the night of June 25, 1906. He and Evelyn, accompanied by two friends, attended the opening of a play called Mamselle Champagne at the dining theater on the roof of Madison Square Garden. The theater was a frequent gathering place for New York society, and thousands of the city's wealthiest people were all in attendance. For the occasion, Evelyn donned a daring white satin gown and looked spectacular under the stage lights. Soon after taking their seats, she and Thaw noticed Stanford White being ushered to a table in the privileged section near the footlights. The play turned out to be a dull one, and in time the Thaws rose to leave. As Harry stepped out into the aisle, he looked down the length of it and saw White framed dramatically at the end. While the girls in the chorus sang a production number, Thaw walked down the aisle and stopped next to White, who pretended not to see him. He then calmly reached into his coat, withdrew a revolver, and fired three shots into the architect's head. Two of those bullets slammed into White's brain, and he died immediately. His heavy frame crashed forward on the table and then rolled over onto the floor. Thaw then changed his grip on the pistol, holding it by the muzzle so that it was plain that he didn't intend to shoot anyone else. He was arrested and taken to Center Street Station. Thaw was charged with murder and placed in the tombs to await his trial. After he was arraigned for murder, Thaw's mother, who was in England at the time visiting her daughter, 
the Countess of Yarmouth, announced that she was returning to the United States to stand by her son. She said, I am prepared to pay a million dollars to save his life. She hired the famous trial lawyer Delphin Delmas from California to defend her son. He would be opposed by the equally famous district attorney William Travers Jerome, who, upon hearing that the Thaw fortune was at stake for Harry's defense, stated, with all of his millions, Thaw is a fiend. No matter how rich a man is, he cannot get away with murder. Thaw's trial did not begin until January 21, 1907. In the seven months that preceded it, William Stanford White underwent a character assassination in the newspapers that was unprecedented for an American of his distinction and society connections. There were so many tales of his amorous activities that for even half of them to be true, he would have had to have slept with the majority of the young women and girls in New York. The most famous stories involved White's legendary Red Velvet Swing, which was secreted in one of the many love nests that he kept throughout the city. In this heavily curtained pleasure palace on the west side, he was alleged to keep the velvet swing hanging from the ceiling. In this swing, he would place his young women dressed like little girls and would wildly push them back and forth. It was said that he would peer lasciviously up their billowing skirts in prelude to more adult passions. The campaign of slander and vilification against White was masterminded by Ben Atwell, a press agent hired by Thaw's mother. She also financially backed a play based loosely on the events that occurred, or at least in the way that the yellow press had painted them. The play featured three characters named Harold Daw, Emmeline Hudspeth Daw, and Stanford Black. In this first scene, the Black character brutally assaulted a blind man asking for news of his beautiful young daughter. The play ended with Daw shooting Black during a performance in a roof garden theater, then declaring from his cell at the tombs, no jury on earth will send me to the chair no matter what I have done or what I have been for killing the man who defamed my wife. That is the unwritten law made by men themselves, and upon its virtue I will stake my life." The play was not exactly subtle, but it was popular. It likely had an effect on the legal proceedings that followed, for while the case certainly seemed open and shut, the trial lasted for more than four months. From the start, Thaw's attorney would claim his client to be innocent and that a form of insanity had made him want to kill White. And while Thaw may have been insane, he would state that his urge to kill had come from a mysterious force outside his body, namely that he was possessed by the spirits of the dead. The claim was supported by a doctor of medicine and a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science named Dr. Carl Wickland. The Chicago doctor's wife was a proponent of spiritualism and a professed medium. Three weeks after Thaw's arrest, Mrs. Wickland insisted that a spirit voice came through her during a seance and confessed that it had forced Thaw to kill Stanford White. The spirit told the group gathered in the seance room, I killed Stanford White. He deserved death. He had trifled too long with our daughters. According to Mrs. Wickland, the ghost identified himself as a man named Johnson. He had been from a lower social scale when he was among the living and denounced the wealthy, saying that the rich womanizers like Stanford White had no right to live, stealing our children from us and putting fine clothes on them. The spirit's daughter was allegedly a young girl named Susie, a 15-year-old model who had been the highlight of a bohemian party that White attended. She had risen out of a giant pie and exhibited her charms, which were scarcely hidden behind a wisp of chiffon. White was so taken with her that he plied her with champagne and, when she was intoxicated, took her to one of his apartments and seduced her. Later, he turned her out, penniless, and she died at the age of 23 and was buried in a pauper's grave. In addition to Johnson's angry spirit, another entity also came through during the seance, he identified himself as Harry Thaw's deceased father. He defended his son and claimed that the young man had been sensitive to spirit influence throughout his life. The spirit added that he never understood Harry's actions when he was alive, but in death realized that his son's depraved activities 
were the result of having been a tool in the hands of earthbound spirits, evil spirits that ordered death. The ghost went on to add explicitly that Harry Thaw was obsessed by revengeful spirits when he killed Stanford White. It was certainly a novel defense and one that played well with the jury. Delphin Delmas and the other lawyers representing Thaw used it to muddy the waters while they assassinated the character of Stanford White. It only served to help the case that prosecuting attorney William Travers Jerome was curiously inept during this peak moment in his career. He lost his temper several times in court while its opponent stayed calm and clever. Delmas brought Evelyn into court looking very demure and innocent in sailor blouses and Buster Brown collars. A crowd of over 10,000 milled around outside, hanging on news that filtered from the building. Inside of the courtroom, spectators soaked up the steamy details of Evelyn's seduction and her descriptions of sex with Stanford White, some of which was alleged so risque that the delicate young woman would only whisper it into the ear of the judge. Evelyn first met White in 1901 when she was just 16 years old. A girlfriend took her to lunch at the architect's apartment on West 24th Street. A second man was there but left after the meal. White then took the girls upstairs to her room where the red velvet swing hung from the ceiling. He let the girls take turns on it as he pushed them. Evelyn recalled right up to the ceiling they had a big Japanese umbrella on the ceiling so when we swung up very high our feet passed through it. White did not lose touch with Evelyn, who he considered his new discovery. He met her mother by arrangement and suggested that Evelyn should have some dental treatment. He sent her a hat, a feather boa, and a long red cape. Throughout, he behaved with the utmost correctness. Evelyn testified at supper he wouldn't let me have but one glass of champagne, and he said I mustn't stay up late. He took me home himself to the Arlington Hotel where we were staying and knocked on my mother's door. Then came the day when Evelyn's mother left town to visit friends in Pittsburgh, dismayed at leaving her daughter alone in New York. When he heard of this, White immediately offered his services, promising to take good care of the girl if she was left in his care. He made Evelyn promise in front of her mother not to go out with anyone but him while her mother was away. White paid for her mother's trip to Pittsburgh and, the second night after her departure, sent a note to the theater where Evelyn was appearing in Floridora and asked her to a party at his apartment. When she arrived, there was no one else there, and White lamely explained that no one else was able to come. He suggested that they have something to eat, and afterwards, White offered to show her the rooms that she had not seen during her previous visit. He took her up some back stairs to a bedroom, and poured her a glass of champagne. Evelyn later said her head began to pound, the room started spinning, and she passed out. When she revived, Evelyn was in the bed. All of her clothing was gone, and White was naked and lying beside her. There were mirrors all around the bed. Evelyn remembered, I started to scream, and Mr. White quieted me. I don't remember how I got my clothes on or how I went home, but he took me home. Then he went away and left me, and I sat up all night. Evelyn implied that the two of them engaged in sex that night, but testimony of it was not admitted into the trial. White called on her the next day and found her sitting in a chair, staring out the windows. She was obviously upset, but White reassured her. He told her everyone does those things. She asked if the various people that she had met at the parties with White also made love, and White convinced her that they did, but it was always kept secret. She was told that it was important that they not be found out, and White made her promise not to say a word about it to her mother. Harry Thaw was also smeared during all of the mudslinging that took place during the trial, although his attorney managed to make his bizarre sexual proclivities a further symptom of his madness, whether it was inspired by the spirits or simply garden-variety insanity. Reporters managed to dig up stories of Thaw beating and whipping young women, including a legal suit brought against him by Ethel Thomas in 1902. He had purchased a dog whip one day in a store, and when she asked him what it was for, he told her that he intended to use it on her. 
She said, I thought he was joking, but no sooner were we in his apartment and the door locked than his demeanor changed. A wild expression came into his eyes, and he seized me and with his whip beat me until my clothes hung in tatters. Evelyn has also suffered from the same sort of treatment from Thaw. The trouble began when they were staying at a castle that Thaw had rented in Austria. One morning, she had come to breakfast wearing only her bathrobe. After the meal had finished, Thaw accompanied her to the bedroom, where he ripped the bathrobe from her body, leaving her completely naked save for her slippers. She testified, his eyes were glaring and he had in his hands a cowhide whip. He seized hold of me and threw me on the bed. I was powerless and attempted to scream, but he placed his fingers in my mouth and tried to choke me. He then, without any provocation and without the slightest reason, began to inflict on me several severe and violent blows with the cowhide whip. So brutally did he assault me that my skin was cut and bruised. I besought him to desist, but he refused. I was so exhausted that I shouted and cried. He stopped every minute or so to rest and then renewed his attacks upon me, which he continued for about seven minutes. He acted like a demented man. I was absolutely in fear for my life. It was nearly three weeks before I was sufficiently recovered to be able to get out of my bed and walk. Why, many people wondered, had she married a man who treated her so badly? Evelyn's motives seemed clear. The desire for wealth and position. Thaw was apparently persuaded to marry Evelyn at her family's insistence. The alternative was a charge of corrupting a minor since Thaw, like White, had gotten involved with the young woman when she was underage. The trial ended on April 11, 1907, but after being out for more than 24 hours, the jury announced that they had been unable to reach a verdict. On the final ballot, it was later learned seven had voted Thaw guilty of first-degree murder, and five had voted him not guilty by reason of insanity. Thaw was kept in custody until his second trial started in early January 1908. This time, his ordeal was shorter, and on February 1st, the second jury came to the conclusion that something had temporarily taken over control of Harry Thaw at the time of the murder. They returned a verdict of not guilty on the grounds of insanity at the time of the commission of the act. Thaw had been saved from the electric chair, but he certainly wasn't free. He was imprisoned for life at the New York State Asylum for the Criminally Insane at Matawan, New York. Attempts by his attorneys and by his mother, who spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to get him declared sane, were protracted and unsuccessful. On the morning of August 17, 1913, Thaw escaped from the asylum. With the aid of a limousine that was waiting outside the gates, he fled and sought refuge in Canada. The next month, under pressure from the U.S. government, the Canadian Minister of Justice agreed to return him to the United States. He was jailed in Concord, New Hampshire, and fought a long legal battle against returning to New York. He was not sent back to stand trial again until December 1914. Meanwhile, Evelyn went on to become a vaudeville attraction. Her beauty wasted away before cheap audiences, but not before she became pregnant with a son that she stubbornly insisted was Harry Thaw's. When reporters pointed out that Thaw had been inside a mental institution for the past seven years, Evelyn swore that Harry had bribed a guard at the hospital and she had been allowed to spend the night with him. The baby, for whom she filed for huge support payments, was a result of that one evening. In July 1915, a New York court pronounced Thaw sane and cleared him of all charges. Shortly after his release from jail, he publicly denounced Evelyn and denied that he had anything to do with fathering her child. Soon after, he divorced her and went on an outrageous spending spree, hoping to burn through whatever inheritance he could. Unfortunately for Thaw, he was jailed again in 1916. He was arrested for horsewhipping a teenager named Frederick Gump, and while Thaw tried to buy off the boy's family with over a half million dollars, he was still sent back to the mental hospital. He was kept there under tight security until his release in 1922. After that, Thaw continued his interrupted career of high living 
until his death in 1947. He traveled the world, sporting attractive young girls on his arms and billed himself to reporters as a theatrical and movie producer. Needless to say, Thaw never moved in entertainment circles and most laughed off his pretensions to a vivid imagination. Or perhaps it was something else. On certain occasions, Thaw's playful gaze would become a wild stare, and his mouth would open to emit strange words that seemed to pass incoherently from his lips. Insanity or influences from beyond this world? If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. It was a dark and stormy night about three years ago in a suburb of Oklahoma City. My girlfriend and I were watching TV at her grandmother's house when we heard a loud boom. Suddenly the lights went out and all we could hear was the beat of rain and the roar of wind. No more than a minute after the lights went out, we heard a roaring that sounded like a tornado. It was just us there and we ran and hid in the bathtub with a blanket over the top of us. After about two minutes, it got quiet. Then the lights and the television came back on. We checked the news, but there was no report of a tornado near us. Gary England didn't even mention bad weather in the area. I felt the house shaking, so I went outside to take a look. I turned on the light to the backyard and saw that plastic cups were still on the patio table, that all the plastic chairs were upright. Everything was dry. One thing was different, though. On the table outside was an unfamiliar watch, still with the right time even. My girlfriend took the watch inside, and the next day, her grandmother told her it was her grandfather's watch, and she hadn't seen it in a very long time. So basically, it was a ghost tornado that never happened. Two men, Tom Young and Keith Reinhardt, were both going through midlife crises. Both of them rented the same retail space in Silver Plume, Colorado, and both disappeared in the Colorado Rocky Mountains only one year apart. Even stranger was the fact that Keith had delved deeply into Tom's life and was writing a novel about him. The main character, Guy Gypsum, took on qualities of both men. Although hunters located Tom in 1988, Keith has never been found, and his bizarre case remains open to this day. Silver Plume is a quaint, historic town in Clear Creek County, Colorado. Early settlers had hoped to strike gold, but only ever found clumps of grayish ores that they deemed worthless. What the miners actually found was silver ore. In 1987, this tiny town only had around 200 residents. One of these, local man Tom Young, 
took his dog for a walk one day. Neither he nor his pet ever returned. Nine months later, in June 1988, a local sports writer in Illinois, Keith Reinhardt, was having something of a midlife crisis. He was about to turn 50 and wanted to accomplish certain things while he was still young enough. On top of that, living in Chicago was starting to take its toll on him. He was becoming more stressed and started to gain weight, lose focus, and wondered what the future might hold for him. Even though he held a decent job and was a married man of three years with two children, there was a void that needed filling. Reinhard had an old friend called Ted Parker who owned the KP Cafe in Silver Plume and often mentioned a slower pace and quieter life there. So Reinhard informed Caroline, his wife, that he wanted to spend some time in Silver Plume alone and work on a novel. Plus, by doing some hiking in the mountains, he hoped to get into better shape and overcome his fear of heights. Even though she was initially wary of this idea, she relented and allowed him to fulfill his dream. Reinhardt took a three-month sabbatical from work and departed for Silver Plume. He settled in and found a vacant shop right next to the cafe on Main Street that he leased in order to sell antiques and matted photographs. Not long after his arrival in this sleepy town, someone mentioned that the previous tenant of the space had disappeared without a trace just a year before. Reinhardt considered this to be an ideal story to tell and began to research Tom Young. Curiosity quickly turned into an obsession. Unfortunately, Reinhardt was beset with problems. The shop wasn't doing much business, understandably in a small town like Silver Plume. On top of that, he began to get writer's block and his inspiration started to wane. Reinhardt may have become a little disillusioned with how things were going, but he did love walking in the nearby Rocky Mountains. On the 31st of July, 1988, local hunters were patrolling the mountain wilderness approximately an hour's walk from Silver Plume when they found a skeleton propped up against a tree. Not far away was a backpack, a pistol, and the skeletal remains of a dog. It was Tom Young and his dog, Gus. Both had a gunshot wound to the head. This discovery helped bring additional details to light. Several days before he disappeared, Young had bought a pistol. Police treated this as a simple suicide, but others were not so easily convinced. Young was extremely fond of Gus, and locals couldn't see any reason for Young to shoot Gus at all. According to Unsolved Mysteries, ballistic tests were unable to match the bullets to the gun. The mystery of what happened to Tom Young may or may not have been solved, but there was one more to follow. A week after Young and Gus were found, Reinhardt closed up his shop for the day. The evening was drawing on, and Reinhardt walked all around town and to the cafe, and he told everyone he encountered that he was heading out to hike up to Pendleton Mountain. Those that he told assumed that he was kidding them. A round trip on the mountain would take about six hours. Sunset in Silver Plume in August occurs around 8 p.m., and very few people are skilled enough to hike the Rockies at night. Also, the elevation at the top of Pendleton Mountain is more than 12,000 feet, and the risk of exposure to the elements is very high, even in July. Wild animals such as mountain lions and bears can also pose a threat. Reinhard had no preparation at all and no suitable mountain gear or supplies when he was seen heading toward the base of the mountain. This was not his first attempt, though. Friends recalled that his previous attempt ended when he showed signs of vertigo. Reinhardt set a deadline of 10 p.m. for his return and departed at 4.30 p.m. This was the last time he was ever seen in the plume. When the following morning arrived, there was still no sign of Keith Reinhardt. The Colorado Alpine Rescue Team launched a huge rescue operation involving helicopters, search dogs, and many townsfolk. After one week, nothing had been found. Searchers knew that the rescue effort was not going to be an easy one, and at least one person commented that this was the classic needle-in-a-haystack endeavor. The search was finally called off on the 12th of August, 1989, when, sadly, a Cessna carrying two of the searchers crashed only one of the pair survived the impact. 
two men that vanished under strikingly similar circumstances in a town as small as Silver Plume a year apart appeared to be more than just a coincidence. Friends of both men were at a loss to explain any of it. A strange discovery was found in Keith's home. Next to his computer, a newspaper article about Tom Young laid open. On his computer, the manuscript for his novel was not finished, but there was a passage about a man called Guy Gypsum. It read, Guy Gypsum changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood it all now and his motivations. Guy closed the door and then walked off toward the lush, shadowless Colorado forests above. From what friends can tell, these were the final words that Keith Reinhard had written. Was he setting the stage for his own disappearance? Reinhard did something else that may point to a setup. One week before he walked off into the mountains, he wrote a letter to the editors of the Herald newspaper where he worked in Illinois to tell them that when he returned, he wanted to cover the Chicago Bulls. This would certainly make a disappearance appear accidental. Almost as soon as he vanished, everyone began to speculate about the possible reasons as to why he vanished. Among these is the idea that Reinhardt had no intention of returning, that the whole thing was certainly engineered on his part. The night before he disappeared, Reinhardt was at a party and was seen talking extensively with a woman named Greta or Gretchen who was presumed to be from Denver. Could she have had something to do with him deciding to escape his life? The last passage he wrote can be taken into a different context if that was the case. He had uprooted himself and left behind everything that he had known already. Could he have done it again? Extending that idea a little further is the run-up to his own disappearance. Reinhardt had shown more than a healthy interest in Tom Young. Might have Keith Reinhardt wanted to be the new Tom Young? Reinhardt might have had issues with life in general, but nobody has admitted that he had some sort of death wish. There was also no record of him ever owning a firearm. Authors do tend to try and live the characters that they create, and perhaps this was what Reinhardt was doing. Perhaps his lack of preparation ultimately cost him dearly. An unforeseen injury might have had a more detrimental effect than it otherwise could have done. The terrain on and around the mountain is treacherous at best, deadly at worst. The problem with that idea is that there was not a long time between the disappearance and the search efforts. Perhaps this was some kind of publicity stunt that ended up going wrong. The fatal crash of the Cessna might have convinced him not to re-emerge and chose to remain in hiding, perhaps even in a place like Mexico. There have been numerous sightings attributed to Reinhardt since his disappearance, but few of them have been dismissed by the authorities. There is another possibility. As well as their disappearances, both men had another thing in common – the shop itself. Some people put a lot of importance on this single fact – both men might have become aware of something in relation to the store that they were not supposed to know. Reinhard may have met a similar fate or made a discovery that forced someone to act once more. For either supposition to be true, then surely someone must have had access to the store. That would suggest a local was responsible for both deaths if Reinhard indeed died on that mountain. Did the same thing happen to Tom Young and then Keith Reinhardt? Could the same culprit have struck twice? Although there has been much debate and conjecture about this case over the last three decades, nobody is any closer to an answer. Professor Bernard Carr is a professor of mathematics and astronomy at the Queen Mary University of London. He studied under Stephen Hawking and earned his doctorate at Cambridge. This is not a man to make up mumbo-jumbo to gain attention, nor is he in the habit of spouting half-baked theories about ghosts and aliens fabricated from baseless speculation. 
So when Professor Carr says that paranormal activity is real and that it's actually happening in another dimension, it's important not to dismiss him as yet another conspiracy theorist trying to become internet famous. In a talk at the EuroPA conference, Carr explained why we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss so-called paranormal events. Carr believes that there is a hierarchical structure to the dimensions, many of which we cannot perceive, but that the human consciousness is able to periodically perceive events that are occurring on planes of existence that we are otherwise usually unable to interpret. According to his talk's abstract, the model resolves well-known philosophical problems concerning the relationship between matter and mind, elucidates the nature of time, and provides an ontological framework for the interpretation of phenomena such as apparitions, OBEs, out-of-body experiences, NDEs, near-death experiences, and dreams. Consciousness is a difficult concept to nail down. Philosophers have been debating the matter for centuries. Scientists have likewise attempted to formulate a definitive explanation for what enables us to think and reason as human beings. Paranormal activity is rarely recorded with any accuracy, but some events have been reported that our current understanding of scientific laws simply can't explain. Rather than dismiss these occurrences out of hand, Carr recommends we consider the possibility that they might be a part of something we just don't yet understand. Carr's theory assumes that if these events are taking place, they probably are not happening in one of the three dimensions that we are capable of perceiving. If a person who exists in three dimensions were to place an object in a 2D space, it would appear to suddenly materialize to anyone within that world who has no understanding of a higher dimension. Thus, Carr suggests, what may seem like weird and impossible events could be easily explained if we take into account the fact that our brains are limited by the plane of existence that we're used to interacting with. Said Carr, since the only non-physical entities in the universe of which we have any experience are mental ones, and since the existence of paranormal phenomena suggests that mental entities have to exist in some sort of space. There is no way to prove Carr's theory, and as the news has been reported primarily by the Daily Express, it's impossible to guarantee the concepts he presented have been accurately communicated. Nevertheless, it's interesting to consider the possibility that accounts of supernatural events might not be as strange or bizarre as people think. After all, sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct one, and it's certainly easy to explain paranormal events by arguing that humans are dumb. Whether that justifies a belief in ghosts is up to you. The year was 1941, and the world was at war. Although they didn't know it yet, on November 22, 1941, the United States was on the eve of entering the escalating war that was raging across two oceans. It was a tense time on our planet, a couple of weeks before Japan would launch its fateful attack on Pearl Harbor, and Americans everywhere were scouring the news to keep a wary eye on the tumultuous events unfolding overseas. On this particular November day, two innocuous ads appeared in the New Yorker magazine for a dice game called simply the Deadly Double. The advertisements were seemingly harmless and looked similar to many other ads that filled the newspaper and magazines of the time, so nobody gave them much thought and certainly no one was aware at the time that these innocent ads would go on to become one of the most perplexing mysteries of World War II. The ads themselves, at first glance, seem to have a sort of strange design to them, but are fairly nondescript for the most part. The first ad, which was placed near the front page of the magazine, has an illustration of two dice depicted in mid-tumble. On the visible faces of one die is written the numbers 0, 5, and 7. The other die shows the numbers 12, 24, and the Roman numeral 20XX. 
The dice are positioned under a dramatic heading announcing a warning in a few different languages. Aktung – Warning, Alert At the bottom of the ad, the reader is encouraged to see an advertisement on page 86, and the bottom reads, Monarch Publishing Company, New York. It was a little odd that the dice would have numbers that don't typically appear on regular dice, but it didn't really raise any eyebrows at the time. When one follows the instructions and opens to page 86, they find another ad that is more elaborate and appears to be the main ad, while the other is merely a teaser. It has the same heading of Octung Warning Alert, with another illustration showing an air raid in progress and, under that, a group of people huddling in an air raid shelter playing a dice game. At the very bottom is a stylized drawing of a double-headed eagle. There is also some copy written in the ad. The first part says, We hope you'll never have to spend a long winter's night in an air raid shelter. But we were just thinking. It's only common sense to be prepared if you're not too busy between now and Christmas. Why not sit down and plan a list of the things you'll want to have on hand? This is followed by a list of necessary items for an air raid. The list ends with another piece of copy which reads, And though it's no time really to be thinking of what's fashionable, we bet that most of your friends will remember to include those intriguing dice and chips which makes Chicago's favorite game the deadly double. This part is followed by the two X's inside of a shield within the double-headed eagle, and finally a tagline announcing that the game was available in department stores everywhere. The ads were perhaps in poor taste and certainly a bit weird, but many ads at the time displayed a certain dramatic flair, and nothing about this one in particular really caused any concern. It was not until Japan launched its deadly attack on Pearl Harbor, 16 days later, that a spotlight would be cast on the advertisements and their mysteries would become apparent. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese sent two waves of a total of 353 fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes which laid waste to the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and would be the trigger for America's active participation in World War II. The wake of the devastation would leave an estimated 188 U.S. aircraft destroyed, 30 vessels crippled, 2,403 Americans killed, and 1,178 wounded. It was in the aftermath of this shocking surprise attack that Americans became obsessed with the idea that traitors, Japanese spies, and Nazi secret agents were infiltrating the homeland. The FBI, for its part, methodically tracked down and arrested thousands of people it had deemed as subversives and were actively investigating every lead, piece of evidence, or rumor connected with sabotage from enemies of the state. It was during this rising tension and fear of the enemy among us that the FBI became interested in the New Yorker Deadly Double ads, and the previously seemingly harmless ads started to be seen in a whole new light. A large number of readers pointed out that the numbers and imagery in the ads were a little too close to the events at Pearl Harbor to be mere coincidence or serendipity, and the FBI started to think that perhaps the attacks were not as much of a surprise for some than it seemed. The ads were soon deemed to be a possible coded communication from Japan and Germany to their agents, spies, and sympathizers within the U.S., warning that war was upon them and the mystery of the deadly double would begin its ascent into the annals of great World War II mysteries. The ads were interpreted by the FBI as conveying several pieces of covert information within the innocent-looking ads, some of it subtle and some of it not so much so in retrospect. In the first ad, the numbers 12 and 7 written on the dice were seen as perhaps showing the date of the Pearl Harbor attacks, December 7th or 12-7. The numbers 5 and 0 were interpreted as signifying 5 out of 24 hours, or the time of the attack, and the Roman numerals XX, or 20, represented the latitude of the target. This left the number 24, the exact meaning of which could not be discerned but was deemed to possibly be some kind of code to identify the person or persons who had placed the ads. 
The second main part of the ad on page 86 prominently displayed a picture of an air raid in progress, which depicted what appeared to be bombers heading out over water, searchlights, and an exploding bomb on the water's surface, all imagery that suggests Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The double-headed eagle was reminiscent of a sort of combination of the two versions of the Nazi Iron Eagle symbols. Even the product of the ads, the deadly double, was seen to represent the two main Axis powers, Germany and Japan. Add to all of this that no game called the deadly double was found to be available in department stores as promised, or to indeed have ever existed at all and all of these clues added up to being something that was seen as beyond coincidence. The FBI looked into the apparent publisher of the ad, the Monarch Trading Company, but found that the company did not exist, and so it was suspected to be merely a dummy corporation. The FBI then turned its attention to the New Yorker and conducted an investigation of their offices looking for answers, but instead uncovered more puzzles. It was revealed that the ads had been set into type somewhere else and their matrix delivered to the New Yorker by a white male who had not given his name. The man had reportedly physically passed the plates by hand over the counter at the magazine office himself and paid in cash. It was surmised that the man had likely created the place himself. The FBI was eventually able to track down a man by the name of Roger Craig who they suspected as being the one who placed the ads but in a menacing turn of events, it turned out the suspect had died in an accident under mysterious circumstances. When Mr. Craig's widow was questioned about the events, she reportedly told the FBI that the whole thing was nothing more than a coincidence. Finding nothing but dead ends and being swamped with an ever-growing deluge of other leads, the FBI dropped the case, and to this day it has remained unresolved. What was the deadly double? Were the ads a sophisticated, coded message from Germany and Japan to warn co-conspirators of the Pearl Harbor attacks? Was it just a coincidence or the result of people just reading too much into the ads? Over the years, there's been a good amount of debate on the nature of the deadly double ads and a lot of discussion on the supposed clues hidden within them. Yet there has never been any concrete resolution to the mysteries they pose. For now, these bizarre ads remain a somewhat haunting enigma and one of the most enduring mysteries of World War II. To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3, written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.
the Dardeen family met a truly disturbing end in their small town of Ina, Illinois in 1987. More than a decade later, a serial killer sitting on death row in Texas would claim he committed the crimes, along with more than 70 other slayings. Yet the truth of the Dardeen's final moments remains as uncertain today as it was on the evening of November 18, 1987, when police first discovered their brutalized bodies. The police visited the trailer because Russell Keith Dardeen, then 29 years old, hadn't shown up for his job as a water treatment plant operator at the nearby Rend Lake Water Conservancy District. Reportedly, Keith, he preferred to go by his middle name, was an extremely reliable worker when he neither appeared for work nor called in to report his absence. The supervisor placed calls to both of Keith's parents who said that they hadn't seen him. By evening, the police went to the Dardeen family home to investigate, where they met Don Dardeen, Keith's father, who had brought keys to the trailer. What they found inside was a crime scene so violent and gruesome that it would haunt everyone involved for years to come. Elaine Dardeen and her three-year-old son Peter had been beaten to death with a baseball bat that had been a birthday present to Peter from his father earlier that year. To make matters worse, Elaine had been pregnant with the couple's second child, a daughter, and the beating caused her to go into labor. The killer, or killers, had shown no mercy, however, and the newborn child was beaten to death as well. Elaine was bound with duct tape and gagged, and all three were tucked into bed together. The area had even been cleaned up, indicating that the killer or killers had been in no hurry to vacate the crime scene. The initial suspicions that Keith Dardeen had brutally murdered his own family were quickly laid to rest when his body was found the following day, lying in a nearby field. He had been shot three times and his penis was cut off. Police found Keith's car parked outside the police station in the nearby town of Benton, some 11 miles from the Dardeen home. Blood on the interior indicated that it was the likely site of Keith Dardeen's murder. Such a brutal crime would have been enough to shock a rural community, but the fact was that the Dardeens were not the first victims in the area. Over the past two years, Jefferson County had been home to 15 homicides, including one particularly grim case in which a teenager living in Mount Vernon killed his parents and three siblings. While the spate of murders seemed unrelated, it was enough to drive locals into an intense state of fear. During the days and weeks following the discovery of the Dardeen family murders, locals took to openly carrying shotguns, and the coroner in nearby Franklin County was quoted as saying that locals were so afraid to let strangers into their homes that if he ran out of gas on a country road, he wouldn't even bother knocking on the door and would instead simply walk to the highway and hitch a ride. In spite of a massive investigation involving 30 detectives dedicating full-time work to the case and interviewing more than 100 people, the police were not able to determine a motive for the killings, let alone find a likely suspect. As time passed and the case grew colder and colder, Joanne Dardeen, Keith's mother, continued to pressure authorities to try to solve the murders of her son and his family. She gathered more than 3,000 signatures in an attempt to get The Oprah Winfrey Show to do a segment on the murders, which were deemed too graphic for daytime television. Similarly, America's Most Wanted also initially passed on the case, though they later did a segment in 1998 that produced no new leads. It wasn't until the year 2000 that new light was thrown upon the brutal slaying of the Dardeen family. That year, a serial killer named Tommy Lynn Sells, who had been arrested after cutting the throats of two girls near Del Rio, Texas, began confessing to other murders that he claimed he had committed over the years while riding the rails and working at traveling carnivals. One of the killings that Sells claimed responsibility for was the murder of the Dardeen family. According to Sells, he met Keith at a truck stop, or maybe a pool hall, and Keith invited him home to dinner, where Keith then propositioned Sells to engage in a threesome with him and Elaine. Or maybe not. 
Baby Cells just saw the for sale sign on the Dardeen's trailer and, with it, an opportunity. Part of the problem with the confession of Tommy Lynn Cells is that he didn't always stick to his own story, let alone the particulars of the case. When Cells first confessed in 2000, Joanne Dardeen was convinced of his guilt. As the years went by, however, her conviction waned, and by the time Cells was executed in 2014, her doubts were significant. Tommy deserved to die for what he did, she said, but I wanted him to stay alive until I knew positively he didn't do it. Though Sells confessed to more than 70 murders, at the time of his execution, authorities were only convinced of his guilt in 22 of his supposed killings. The brutal slaying of the Dardeen family wasn't one of them, and to this day, the chilling Illinois murder case officially remains unsolved. The ghost of a well-known impresario and a host of hauntings means that Cromer Pier is a magnet for paranormal investigators. Those spirits do love to be beside the seaside. It's the grand old lady of Cromer which allows visitors to walk on water and enchants everyone who sets eyes on her. It's unsurprising, therefore, that even supernatural guests have felt loath to leave. Originally built in 1391, the pier was little more than a jetty. Letters granting the right to levy duties for repairs suggest that the jetty was maintained until 1580, until Queen Elizabeth I granted the right to those who lived in Cromer to export malt, wheat, and barley for the maintenance of their town and towards the rebuilding of the pier. A 210-foot wooden jetty was built in 1822 but lasted just 24 years until the North Sea claimed it during a ferocious storm. Replaced it in 1843 by a 240-foot structure, the new pier was regulated by stringent bylaws which forbade smoking until 9 p.m. when it was assumed ladies would have retired to bed. After a storm, the town remained peerless for almost 15 years, until 1901 when a 500-foot iron pier was built at a cost of 17,000 pounds. A bandstand was built at the head of the pier within eyeshot of the drowned village of Shipton, which was later extended to create a pavilion. It is this pavilion which became the Pavilion Theater, which is of greatest interest to those who seek the unusual and the unexplained. Concert parties were played in the pavilion from 1906 and throughout the 1920s and 1930s, and the pier was host to a carousel of entertainment including Ronnie Brandon's Out of the Blue in 1936. In 1978, Irish impresario Dick Condon, one of the theater Royal Norwich's most famous managers, formed a partnership with Cromer Pier and the Seaside Special was created, now an institution which welcomes thousands of theater fans every year. Mr. Condon died in 1991, but it is said that his spirit can still be felt on Cromer Pier. Several performers have reported seeing him on stage, standing next to them. Others have seen his shadow cast across the theater. In addition to those who believe the spirit of Mr. Condon is still at large on Cromer Pier, there have been a host of other ghostly reports. Moaning and shuffling feet have been heard. Mediums report communicating with spirits that date back to the 1300s. Ghostly members of a lifeboat crew have been reported on the boards outside the theater, and visitors and members of staff have witnessed the ghostly apparition of a man in a tall black hat and another ashen-faced man with jet black hair. Members of staff have seen objects moving on their own accord, and bottles and glasses have mysteriously smashed in the bar. Figures wearing medieval clothing have been seen wandering along the pier, and ghostly cries have been heard from the sea. Performers and staff have reported the feeling of being watched backstage and in a particular dressing room, and mysterious disembodied laughter, singing, 
Footsteps, taps, and bangs have been heard across the theater. People talk of a very intense and oppressive atmosphere occasionally felt backstage. The ghostly goings-on attracted the camera crews from Most Haunted in 2009. Yvette Fielding walked the pier with medium Patrick Matthews, who picked up on the spirit of a lady called Elizabeth from the 1920s who had apparently witnessed an accidental manslaughter on the stage. Backstage, Yvette had a spirit mimic her singing and saw an apparition while Stuart and Carl were physically affected by something unknown in the stage area. Gemma Snow, events director and organizer of Friday Nights, Cambridgeshire, and East Anglia, visited Cromer Pier with her friend Graham in February 2017 with a view to talk to staff about organizing a ghost hunt for Halloween. She recalls being taken for a tour of the Pavilion Theater and hearing footsteps and tapping in the auditorium, but assuming they had come from Graham, who was standing behind her as she chatted to staff. I turned to look round twice, and Graham had a puzzled look on his face. Later, it became evident that Graham hadn't made the noises, nor had he shifted his feet. He'd remained completely still and had heard the noises himself. As we walked through the stage door and entered the backstage area, I felt a little peculiar, she says. The only way I could describe the feeling is that I had walked through an invisible wall and the atmosphere changed instantly. It wasn't just a temperature drop, it was like a wall of sadness hit me. I can honestly say that I had never experienced this before. I was standing outside the notoriously haunted dressing room. The group's event was held just before Halloween and two mini ghost hunts were held by Gemma, colleague Linda Hughes, and medium Ian Doherty. During a silent vigil at the foot of the stage, the auditorium was in darkness, illuminated only by torches. Gemma said, I heard a sound which made me turn my head to the right, and as I did so, I saw a black mass move diagonally across the seating area on the right-hand side. I immediately said, Linda, do you see that? to which she replied that yes, she had. A few of the guests also saw the same thing. Was it the tall man in dark clothing wearing a black hat who's been seen in the theater before? I couldn't say, but it's the closest description of what I did see that night. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.